How's everybody doing? I wish I could tell you I had exams for you. I actually had words with my TA today, so not that that's gotten you any exams, but I have made quite clearly my displeasure at this. I've, they are students, and so I recognize that students also, like you guys, have schedules and so forth, but like students, they should also know how important it is that things get back in a timely fashion, right? So, so needless to say, I'm not happy with what's happening there, so I, I can't promise you anything at this point. I will. They're supposed to get them back to me tomorrow. I won't be able to record the grades until tomorrow evening at the very earliest. So the earliest I'll have them for you is Friday. So if I don't have them by Friday, then maybe you may hear of a murder in Corvallis. If you hear of a TA being murdered in Corvallis, you may know who the sus leading suspect will be. All right. <clears throat> now, we are all ready to understand now how our body works with things. I'm going to come back to that, okay? How does our body work given the various things that I've told you? Let's review the sort of headlines of what I've been talking about, okay? Glycolysis. Glycolysis breaks down glucose. Glycolysis relies on NAD, right? Glycolysis, we said, was essential for keeping energy production going when the cells run out of oxygen, right? Very important point. When cells run out of oxygen, they can't make NAD by the electron transport system. That's why they go through fermentation. They're going through fermentation so they can keep glycolysis going, all right? Citric acid cycle. That takes the byproducts of glycolysis that come through pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, Acetyl-CoA then enters the citric acid cycle, and it gets oxidized. And that oxidation requires, just like glycolysis, it requires NAD. It also requires FAD. If we have no NAD, the citric acid cycle will stop because there's no fermentation option for it. It's, it's in the mitochondrion. No fermentation there. Okay? Now... I talked about how NADH is converted back to NAD yesterday, and that was by dumping electrons into the electron transport system. The electron transport system accepts those electrons, it generates NAD, and as a consequence of accepting those electrons, protons get pumped out of the matrix into the intermembrane space. It creates a proton gradient. Yes? It generates NAD. The electron yes, it takes electrons from NADH. That's what generates NAD. That's why you need oxygen to make NAD. Okay? Important point. Now, all right. Now, um, that proton gradient then is the battery that is used to spin that complex 5 and make ATP, right? Now, let's imagine a couple things happening. And as we imagine these things happening, we can actually put the pieces together now and decide why we get fat, why we breathe heavily, why we do the various things that we do, at least as far as weight gain and loss. All right? Now, let's imagine, first of all, that I, I gave the situation yesterday. I'm sitting around. I'm not doing anything. I'm not getting enough exercise. I am taking in more than I am burning up. What's my level of ATP? High. Level of ATP high, level of ADP is low. Low, low ADP, what happens? Well, complex five requires ADP. If I don't have ADP, complex five will not spin. It will stop. When complex 5 stops, protons can no longer enter through it because the spinning is necessary for the protons to come through. No ADP, no spinning, no spinning, no protons coming through. Proton gradient remains high, right? Well, what's happening with electron transport? Electron transport is still occurring, right? Electron transport still is moving electrons through. Electron transport is still pumping protons out. What's happening to the proton gradient? It's getting higher and higher and higher, right? 
I like to you to envision that someone has told you that you've got to push a giant amount of water up a hill. Okay? And you keep pushing and pushing, and the more you push up, the more you get up there, and the more it's fighting you back. That's what that proton gradient is like. As the gradient gets so high, those pumps, complex 1, 3, and 4, no longer have sufficient energy to pump protons out, so they stop. They can't pump any more out because the gradient is too high. When they stop, these are all connected, folks. When they stop, what happens to the production of NAD? It stops because there's no place for NADH to dump its protons off, to dump its, its electrons off to. What happens to the concentration of NADH then? It goes up. And as the concentration of NADH goes up, what happens to the concentration of NAD? Down. And as NAD goes down, what happens to the citric acid cycle? It stops. And with the citric acid cycle, what happens to that burning up of those things that we ate? It stops. Your citrate will go high. As we will see later today, when your citrate goes high, it starts dumping acetyl-CoA in the cytoplasm. And acetyl-CoA is a precursor for making fat. So now you see, if you're taking in more than you're burning, you're going to get fat. No ifs, ands, ors, or buts about it. All right? Let's imagine you decide to get up and you go, wow, man, I need to get out and get some exercise. It's a beautiful day. I'm going to go out and go for a run. Okay? I get up and go out for a run. What's the very first thing that's going to happen in my muscle cells? No, prior to that. What do muscles need for energy? ATP, right? ATP is what they use for energy. If they're going to move, they've got to break down ATP. What happens when ATP concentration falls? ADP concentration goes up, right? When ADP concentration goes up, what happens to complex 5? It starts spinning. And when complex 5 starts spinning, what happens to the proton gradient? It starts falling, right? And when the proton gradient starts falling, what happens to NADH? Now it can dump its electrons because the electron transport system is going again, right? NADH concentrations fall, which means NAD concentrations increase, right? As electron transport system is running, what makes electron transport system happen? Oxygen. We start breathing more heavily. We're out jogging. We're breathing heavily to keep that electron transport system going, right? We start running the citric acid cycle, we are starting to break down that excess food we've been eating. We start breaking that down, what happens to glycolysis? It starts moving forward. Okay, so we start seeing how we start breaking these things down. It's really cool. And every one of these are connected. It's what's called metabolic control. You also hear it called respiratory control. Okay, they're the same thing. The linking of all these processes, one depending upon the other, has consequences. When I stop one of them, I'm going to stop all of them. Okay? When I stop one of them, I'm going to stop all of them. If I stop oxidative phosphorylation, I will stop electron transport. When I stop electron transport, I will stop oxygen usage, I will stop citric acid cycle, and I will stop well, or at least slow down glycolysis. Depends on what I'm doing. Right? Now, there are things known as electron transport inhibitors. I'm going to show you a couple of them. We use them in a laboratory. We don't use them on people. We actually use them on insects occasionally as an insecticide. Okay? Rote known as a natural substance made by some South American plant. I can't recall what it is. Okay? But it's actually used as an, an insecticide. It's actually considered a natural insecticide. It has a very nasty effect on insects. What it is is an inhibitor of complex one in the electron transport system. When rotenone is present, it will stop complex one from letting electrons move through. If I stop complex one, what's going to happen to electron transport? 
Well, it's certainly going to slow down. Why did I say slow down instead of stops? FAD can come in a different direction, right? So FAD comes in after complex one, and that can have, you know, uh, might keep electron transport going some, but it has a pretty nasty effect on insects. They, they don't take it very well. Okay? Amatow also inhibits complex one. Rotenone and amatow both inhibit complex one. Antamycin A is a little bit more nasty. Antamycin A inhibits complex three. Gesundheit. What's going to happen if I inhibit complex three? Pretty much going to stop electron transport. There's a few things that we haven't talked about that allow some bypass of complex three, but they're not real easy to do. So we would predict that antamycin uh, A would be more deadly than would uh, the um, amitalorotenone. Then what happens if we inhibit complex four? Well, we're in deep doo-doo if we inhibit complex four, okay? No way around it. We can't keep electron transport going. If we can't keep electron transport going, we can't pump protons. If we can't pump protons, we can't make ATP. We're in deep doo-doo. Complex four inhibitors are some of the most potent poisons that we know. They include cyanide. They include a compound called azide, A-Z-I-D-E. And they include our old friend carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide will kill you in two ways. It will kill you by blocking hemoglobin's ability to bind oxygen. It will also kill you by stopping complex four. Nasty stuff, okay? Well, these are all Bad things, right? Nasty things, interesting things to think about. I want to turn this table around. I want to think about this in another way. I want to tell you, as I told one student in my office earlier today, about the world's most perfect diet drug. The world's most perfect diet drug. Here's how it works. If you see the ads, right? You see the internet. Their internet is full of, take this pill and you will burn fat as you sleep, right? Has anybody ever not gotten one of those messages? Right? All right. The magic diet pill. One pill. Take it. Go to sleep. Wake up. You're thinner. And did you know that such a pill exists and that it actually works? You're thinking, now it's really getting deep. It does. How does it work? Okay. What this pill does is it's full of a compound called 2,4-dinitrophenol. You'll probably call it 2,4-DNP. 2,4-DNP has a very interesting ability. It pokes a hole in the mitochondrial inner membrane. And when it pokes a hole, it pokes a hole big enough that protons can leak through it. Let's go through this scenario again. If I poke a hole in the mitochondrial inner membrane and protons can leak through the hole, are they going to go through complex 5? Probably not, right? They're going to go through the hole. It's like if I poke a hole in the dam, water's going to come through the hole instead of going through the turbine, right? I'm not going to make any ATP. But my proton gradient's going to start falling, right? So my proton gradient falls. What happens to electron transport? It speeds up, right? What happens to my oxygen consumption? Up. I may be sleeping, but I may be breathing heavily, right? What happens to my uh, concentration of NAD? It goes up because I'm taking electrons away from NADH. As my NAD concentration goes up, what happens to my citric acid cycle? It spins faster. What happens to my glycolysis? It runs faster. I am literally going to burn this stuff as I sleep. We'll see later today we can burn fatty acids in the same way. What's wrong with this diet pill? It worked. It actually worked. It was released about 100 years ago, and people found that if they took this diet pill, they woke up warm. Not surprisingly, if you think about the Big Bang reaction and everything, they woke up warm. They may have breathed heavily overnight, but they lost weight. 
That is the 85% of them that lived. About 15% of the people who took this diet pill died. Nobody knew how it worked at the time. Who wants to ask the first question? There's a question everybody always asks about this diet pill. Does anybody want to be the, the, the one to win the prize and ask it this year? No, it's called 2,4 DNP. I already told you that, yeah. Well, it would do a pretty nasty number in your mitochondria. That's not the question, though. Where can I get it? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. You can't get it. It's, it's been banned, all right? The question usually is, well, what if you take just a little bit? What if you just took a little bit? They took too much. That's why it killed them. So if I just took a little bit, I'd be okay. To which my answer is, why don't you take a little bit of arsenic? A little bit of arsenic might probably cause some weight loss also, right? It probably would not kill you if you took a small enough quantity, but it would have some pretty nasty effects. So it's not something you want to mess with. But it was something that was released around the turn of the 20th century. They actually found that, and, that was, and people's interest in losing weight then were just like they are now. They wanted to have the easy way out of doing it. That's what 2,4-DNP does. And it does it because it does something we call uncoupling. Normally we have oxidative phosphorylation coupled to electron transport. Electron transport drives oxidative phosphorylation. If electron transport stops, oxidative phosphorylation stops. If oxidative phosphorylation stops, electron transport stops. But this uncouples them. It means that when I poke that hole, electron transport's going furiously, and oxidative phosphorylation is doing nothing. Make sense? There's mud? Questions? Yeah. Lisa? Yeah, it probably killed them because they just didn't make any ATP. And moreover, there's probably long term damage that's happening to their mitochondria. It's not something that's probably going to repair itself. So it, if you got beyond a certain point, you probably would not recover because you couldn't grow s healthy cells fast enough. Probably, yeah. So they didn't die immediately? I mean, you know, I don't know the stories. I know about 15% died. So I imagine some who thought it was probably a really good pill probably took two or three of them and probably, probably went pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting stories. Let's see. The last thing I want to talk about are some shuttles. We haven't talked about shuttles. What's a shuttle? You've actually seen them on a couple of slides, but I haven't explained them to you, so now I'm going to explain them to you. A shuttle is just like a shuttle on campus. It hauls things from one place to another. In the cell, cells have shuttles usually to move things across a barrier. The barrier is usually a membrane, and the membrane in this case is the mitochondrial inner membrane um, of, the, uh, of the mitochondria. Why is that important? Well, I told you it's very impermeable. Even protons can't get across it. One of the things that can't get across it that's important is NADH. NADH is generated in the cytoplasm by a variety of reactions, including glycolysis. We would like to be able to get that NADH into the mitochondrion because we really don't want to do fermentation. We want to get those, those electrons into the mitochondrion. Well, NADH itself cannot be transported directly across the mitochondrion. Cells have a shuttle that will do it, and there's two different shuttles I want to talk about. One shuttle is used by insects. It's used by insects. It's the one you see on the screen. And it's very simple and it's very fast. We think about insects, they need to have immediate energy when that fly swatter is getting ready to get them, right? They've got to be able to have immediate energy to do something. They use a shuttle called the glycerol phosphate shuttle. What does it do? Well, here's how it works. Dihydroxyacetone phosphate, where, where have you seen that before? Glycolysis. Glycolysis or gluconeogenesis. You got this stuff floating around out in the cytoplasm, right? Dihydroxyacetone phosphate can accept electrons from NAD to generate NAD, I'm sorry, NADH, and generate NAD, okay? And when it does that, it becomes glycerol phosphate. This was a ketone, this is an alcohol. Okay. Glycerol phosphate 
it turns out there is a shuttle for to get it across the inner mitochondrial membrane. It gets moved across that transport protein to get into the matrix. And when it gets in the matrix, the reverse reaction happens. That is, well, almost the reverse. Look at what happens. Here is glycerol phosphate. Here is dihydroxyacetone phosphate. But look what's happening. FAD is being used to accept the electrons. It becomes FADH2. Do you see a problem with this scheme? What's that? So does FADH2 generate as much energy as NADH? It does not, right? Because its electrons come in after complex one, and complex one is generating a proton gradient. Right? So it's bypassing a step of making a proton gradient. So it's going to generate less of a proton gradient. We're going to get less ATPs. Okay? It still is fast, though. It's very fast. It allows that those electrons, at least in the form of FADH2, to enter the electron transport system and go ahead and make ATP. You just don't get as much. Your book said, uh, or I, should, I keep saying your book. I, I use these figures that I've altered from another book, and so that's where the book comes from. I know I wrote the book, but I keep saying the book. The book says that, uh, depends on who you talk to, if you start with FADH2, you get anywhere from one and a half to two ATPs per FADH2. If you start with NADH, you get anywhere from two and a half to three ATPs starting with NADH. Depends on how you count them. Okay? So, this generates fewer ATPs, but it's quick and allows uh, the rapid generation of energy. This dihydroxyacetone phosphate also has a transport protein. It gets transported back out, and so we see this cycle goes just exactly like you see here. Yes, Lisa? It is, because we have NAD electrons from NADH here ending up over here. Now, I'm going to show you one that... The actual shuttle is glycerol phosphate. Glycerol phosphate is what's carrying the electrons. Yeah. Now I'm going to show you one where NADH actually is generated on the inside. It's one that we use. Okay. Humans use the, the one I'm getting ready to show you. It's more complicated, but I'm going to make it very simple for you. It's called the Melate Aspartate Shuttle. And it looks really complicated. It's not bad. All right. The aim is the same as before. We want to get electrons from NADH into the matrix. We can't move NADH across. We've got to move the electrons. And so we use a shuttle, just like we used before. All right? Here's the very simplifying uh, aspect of this uh, shuttle. Okay? Malate can accept electrons from NADH okay, and becomes, I'm sorry, oxaloacetate can accept electrons from NADH and becomes malate. Here's where we start the process. Glycolysis makes this. NADH concentrations go up. Oxaloacetate gets converted to malate. And we move malate into the matrix using a, pro a, shuttle, a, a protein that, that allows it to go in. Malate is the shuttle. The last one, glycerol 3-phosphate, was the shuttle. Malate is the shuttle here. Inside the mitochondria, and look, NAD goes back to NADH. We have not lost anything in this process. It's much more efficient. Instead of getting 1.5 to 2 ATPs, we're going to get 2.5 to 3 ATPs. Okay. Everything else that's on here is just regenerating the cycle. That's all there is to it. It's not important, is what I'm telling you. The important thing is that malate is the carrier of the electrons. Malate is the carrier of the electrons. We have a reaction going from oxaloacetate to malate. On the inside, we have a reaction going from Malate to oxaloacetate. Everything else is balanced in the equation. Lisa? There's a transport protein that lets malate in. Yep. And out, as you can see. Can insects do this too? Yeah, it's a good question. Can insects do this too? I don't think they do it to the extent that we do. No. I think they primarily use the other one. And some of these are tissue specific, so we may even have some tissues that do the um, FAD shuttle. But in general, we're more common, more likely to use this one. Okay. 
Well, that finishes what I want to say about oxidative phosphorylation, unless there's any other questions. Okay. Let's turn our attention to our next topic, which is quite relevant given what we're talking about with respect to metabolism and weight gain and weight loss and other related things. This is the metabolism of lipids. First, we'll talk about catabolism. Later, we'll talk about anabolism. Catabolism, I remind you, is the breakdown of larger things into smaller things. Okay? So we've got to consider this. All right. Lipids, you recall, are compounds that are fairly insoluble in water. At least they have some component of them that's insoluble in water. Fats in our body are our primary energy storage form. Okay? Glycogen is important for storing glucose, but in terms of overall energy storage, it doesn't compare with fat. Okay? To give you an idea, if we take one molecule of glucose and we completely oxidize it using the citric acid cycle, electron transport, oxidative phosphorylation, all these things, if we take one glucose, we're going to get a maximum, and again, again, this depends on how people count them, so don't worry about exact numbers, but we're going to get a maximum of 38 ATPs. Okay? If we take one fatty acid, like palmitic acid, okay, we will get at least 127 ATPs. Now, palmitic acid has more carbons than glucose does, but even if we account for the carbons, there's still a lot more energy in palmitic acid than there is in glucose. So fats are there for energy storage. They do very good at that. What fats are not good at is quick release of energy. Glycogen in our liver can be broken down in instant into our bloodstream in an instant because glucose is soluble in water. Fatty acids are not soluble in water. Fatty acids have to be packaged up Fats have to be packaged up before they can move into the bloodstream. Okay? That packaging takes time. It's not a good source of rapid energy. We'll talk about that in a bit. Well, let's talk about the breakdown of fat. We all are in favor of this, I think. I know I am. Okay? I'm eating for two again. My problem here, right? I'm carrying this around with me. I want to break this guy down into... Uh, these guys over here. I want to break down, lose these fatty acids. Well, a fat you recall is glycerol that's esterified to three fatty acids. Those are ester bonds right there, there, and there. You remember that lipases catalyze the breakdown of fat into fatty acids? And the way that lipases work is they take off one fatty acid at a time. Okay? Here's a fatty acid that's been released. I can also get fatty acids if I start with phosphatidyl compounds. Where would I have phosphatidyl compounds in the body? Membranes. From membranes. Very good. Okay. Fat is stored in specialized cells called adipose tissue. Membranes are present in every cell that I have in my body. Okay. Well, I want to now deal with how I'm going to metabolize that fatty acid. Let's talk about that. Okay. Actually, let's not talk about that. Let's hold on. These are various places that there are different lipases that work. Specifically, this is a phospholipase, meaning it's working on a phosphatidyl compound. You don't need to memorize these. I'm, not, I'm just showing you this to show you that there are some specificities. They work in different places on there. You can see they clip off the phosphate, they clip off the fatty acid, etc. So. No, no biggie there, but that just shows you different enzymes. It takes more than one enzyme to break down a glycerophospholipid. This should connect to something that we've sort of talked about already. Okay? Sort of talked about already. It turns out the breakdown of fat is controlled hormonally. When I say hormonally, people always assume sex hormone, and that's not the case. Okay? Hormonally has to do with normal body hormones like epinephrine, like glucagon, things like that. Okay? 
These are hormones that bind to receptors on the cell surface. This pathway I'm getting ready to show you, you've actually seen part of it, or at least the end products of part of it, when we talked about glycogen breakdown, because glycogen breakdown is controlled hormonally. You may recall epinephrine stimulated the breakdown of glycogen. The way it does it is very similar to what happens right here. But if we think about what epinephrine was doing, what was epinephrine, what was adrenaline doing in our body to make it possible for us to go and lift that automobile? It was what? Putting phosphates onto proteins, yep. And what, what effect did that have? So it favored the breakdown of glycogen, and the breakdown of glycogen produced glucose. So we flooded our bloodstream with glucose, we got all this glucose, our muscles said, yep, hip, hip, hooray, here's all this glucose, and we can go do incredible things, right? So the epinephrine was favoring the breakdown of things that gave energy. Glycogen gave glucose, which gave energy, right? Epinephrine will similarly activate the breakdown of fat. It will similarly activate the breakdown of fat. Okay. Now, as I said, when we break down fat, we don't have a fast way of dealing with this. So this isn't useful for us in that emergency situation. But it tells us that there are external things that control whether or not fat gets broken down. Should I go scare myself as a way of having a diet? Okay. Maybe, I don't know, Maybe I should try this. Wouldn't it be awful to every, about every five minutes to be scared crapless, you know, just be that'd, be, that'd be awful. What's that? I imagine you probably would, right? So I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, what happens in here? Well, there's, it's, it's interesting, there are, is it just as I showed you for the glycerophospholipids, the phosphatidyl compounds, I showed you there were four different enzymes that broke those down. There are at least two and maybe three enzymes that break this guy down. So only the very first one is hormonally controlled. Once I've taken one of those fatty acids off, the other enzymes kick in and do their thing. Okay. No, I'm not going to ask you to reproduce this. All right. Well, what happens in the breakdown of fatty acids? Let's say I'm a, I'm a cell and I'm needing some energy and so I need to uh, do my thing. How do I get energy out of a fatty acid? Okay. Well, here's how I do it. All right. First, I have to take a fatty acid floating around the cell, and I attach it to a CoA, just like I had acetyl-CoA. In this take taste, in this case, I'm making something called acyl-CoA, A-C-Y-L. An acyl group is basically a fatty acid group, is what it is. So I'm making an acyl-CoA. My first question to you is, based on something we've talked about this term, why in the world would the cell do that? I'll bet nobody can answer that question. There's a very good reason the cell is attaching that CoA onto that fatty acid. It's a very obscure reference. Nope. No? Any quick, quick guesses? What's that? <laughs> I can see that Google is already, is already fired up here, right? Well, I, I'm not going to make a wager with you, all right? But I will tell you it's a cool story. And you probably wouldn't find it on Google, I, I suspect, all right? So how do we make detergents? Saponify, and when we saponify, what are we doing? We're clipping fatty acids off of a fat, right? All right? So clipping fatty acids off of a fat makes a detergent. What effect does a detergent have on protein? It denatures it. Do we want to denature our proteins? No. So to keep these guys from affecting protein structure, cells are attaching coas to them. See, you probably wouldn't have got that off of Google. All right, so CoA gets attached. It provides a handle, but it also provides this, it keeps this guy from acting as a detergent. So okay. I'm sorry? It acts the same way on like, uh, fatty acids? Well, a fatty acid is a detergent, essentially. 
So if I have enough fatty acids, it's going to denature a protein. And if I don't cover up these polar ends, it's, it's going to act as a detergent. So I want, to, I want to keep a handle on these things. And so that's literally what the cells are doing. The handle that they're keeping on it is CoA. Okay, so there's CoA. So when, it's, when a fatty acid makes its way into a cell, it's the first thing that happens is it gets put onto a CoA. And then something odd happens. All right? Well, fatty acid oxidation occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, just like citric acid cycle occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. However, and this is the dumb thing, acyl-CoA will not make it across the mitochondrial membrane. So we just put a bunch of the trouble of putting this CoA on there. Now we want to get in the matrix and say, oh, we can't get it across the membrane. So what does the cell do? They have an enzyme that will take, and it's called carnitine acyl transferase, that little E right there, carnitine acyl transferase, will take the CoA off. So here's the fatty acid coming in. The CoA is kicked off. A carnitine, which is this guy right here, replaces the CoA. So I make something called acyl carnitine. And then the cell says, oh, I can transport that. It moves it into the matrix. And then inside the matrix, the exact opposite happens. The carnitine gets taken off, and CoA gets put back on. It's a shuttle. Yes, it is. It's called the carnitine shuttle. Now, why does it put carnitine out here on in the first place? I don't know. But suffice it to say, we've gotten this guy in here. And the product now is that we have an acyl CoA. Acyl CoA. This R has a bunch of C's out beside it. The process of oxidizing this guy is called beta oxidation. I'll show you that. Beta oxidation. Oh, yeah. Here's a fatty acid. If we use Greek lettering system, alpha is the carbon next to the carbonyl group, beta is the one after that. I call them 1, 2, and 3. You can call them whatever you want to. I don't care. In any event, all of the action we're going to see here is between the alpha and the beta or between carbons 2 and 3, where the carbonyl is carbon number 1. Right? I don't care what you call it. Now, they're labeled in green there. I'm going to show you some reactions, and you've actually seen the reactions before, or at least something very, very similar to them. I want to hear the first person to tell me where they've seen these reactions before. All right? Here we go. There's a single bond. We're making it a double bond. We do that by taking away two electrons and two protons. We make a trans double bond, and in the process, we make FADH2. Where have you seen that? Where? Citric acid cycle. That was succinate dehydrogenase. Right? And succinate dehydrogenase took the protons and electrons away from carbons two and three. All right? Now, next step of the process, okay? This double bond, and by the way, we're not going to worry about the names. This double bond gets water added across it. That creates an OH at position number three and an H up here. Okay? Where have you seen that reaction before? What's that? No. The citric acid cycle. The reaction after the succinate dehydrogenase reaction is the fumarase reaction. That involves adding water to fumarate, and exactly the same thing happens. All right? I think everybody's going to know where the next one's going to come from. The next step of the process, the OH gets oxidized to a ketone. That generates NADH. And where did we see that process class? In the citric acid cycle. That was malate dehydrogenase. We had three consecutive reactions that were identical to the reactions in the citric acid cycle. Dehydrogenation, adding of water, oxidizing of an OH group. That's three consecutive reactions in the citric acid cycle, and the same thing happens here. Okay? Very, very similar types of reactions. Notice I didn't, give you, I didn't ask you to know the names of these guys. 
I didn't ask you to know the names of the enzymes. There are two enzymes I'll ask you. I'll tell you more about these two enzymes up here in a second. But these enzymes down here, we don't care about. You should know where the OHs go. And you should know the generalities of that reaction because you've seen them before in the citric acid cycle. Removal of the protons and electrons, addition of water, oxidation of the hydroxyl. Okay. The last step of the process is called thiolytic cleavage. Thiolytic cleavage, T-H-I-O-L-Y-T-I-C. It involves an enzyme called thiolase. And thiolase basically breaks the bond between, again, carbons number two and three. Or between carbons alpha and beta. All right? Now, what happens in that process is an acetyl-CoA comes off. That's this part of it. We see it right there. And we're left with a fatty acid that has two fewer carbons. That starts and goes back through the process again. And this goes on and on and on until we're down to our last four carbon piece, and it gets split in half to make two two carbon pieces. Most fatty acids have even numbers of carbons. Most of them do. Okay. All right. Now, two enzymes here I want you to know, and they're interesting. Okay, I'll tell you the least interesting one first. It's thiolase. Thiolase is interesting because it's actually used to make ketone bodies. We'll talk about ketone bodies later in the term. When you hear about ketosis and so forth, ketone bodies play a role in that process. Thiolase participates, therefore, in two different enzymatic pathways. I'm sorry, two different metabolic pathways. The synthesis of ketone bodies. Now, that's the least interesting of the two. The other one over here, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, is a very interesting enzyme. It comes in three forms. One form works on very long fatty acids, maybe 26 carbons or so, down to about maybe 16 to 18. That's what it prefers to work on. Okay? It's located elsewhere in the cell. We won't talk about that right now. There's one called medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase because it works on once from about 16 or 18 down to about 8 or so carbons in length. And then there's one called short chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. Well, that's not very interesting, Kevin. Why is that interesting? Well, what's interesting is the medium chain one is frequently found to be deficient in infants that die of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. The thinking is, and it's not a cause effect, but there's frequently an association, the thinking is that these infants may be having difficulties with fat metabolism. Yes? I don't know if there being, it's a good, very good question, I don't know if there being a relationship between the uh, nature of the source of the breast milk, actually, no. Whether it's from a cow or from mom, I, I, I don't know that. Okay. All right, so that's um, fatty acid oxidation. Cool stuff. Questions about that? You're kind of shell-shocked today. What's that? Too much material this week? Should we finish with a song? All right, let's do that. This is a song I actually wrote for this class a couple years ago. And it's called, it's a very simple tune. Should be coming around the mountain. Anthem from BB350. Oh, the students taking BB350, 350. Have an awful lot of things that we must know. 350. With a cedic acid buffer, Kevin Ahern makes us suffer. The exams could not be tougher. 350. There's amino acids I change to recall. And the things it takes to make cholesterol. Anabolic, catabolic, Kevin Ahern's diabolic. I'm becoming alcoholic. 350. There must be a way to jam into my head. All the metabolic enzyme names I dread. Can you help me learn the spaces where the endonuclease has cut the DNA in places? 350. 350. I must find a way to bake a better grade. 
Oh, my GPA will truly get waylaid. I shall overcome frustration to achieve my aspiration on the last examination. 350. Here's the plan I helped made to help me to succeed. Fill the note card with the knowledge I will need. I put all of Ahern quotes of all and with what each one denotes onto a massive stack of notes for 350. So there's just one teensy problem I must fix. It requires some very skillful pim and tricks. Squeezing info I must store onto the card he gave before will mean a font the size of 0.14. Okay, we don't need to repeat that. All right. No, you do it by hand. But doing it by hand, I couldn't think of a funny line. Until I just said it right here. I got more laughs out of this than I got out of the line, so. All right, guys, see you on Friday. Exams should be ready by Friday. How are you doing? Better. Good. Um, quick question. So the difference between acetyl-CoA and, and um, acyl-CoA is simply the length of the